Thank you. You may be seated. Good afternoon. I'm Bishop Goodlander and I will, uh, am conducting. We'd like to um, also acknowledge President uh, Mike Miller, our state president, with us on the stand. Um, we're grateful. It's good that you're here. The uh, we like to extend our condolences to the Thornley family and to um, uh, express our love and and uh, and uh, love for each of them. Um, we're grateful for their, they would like to express their gratitude to each of you also for the love and support that you have shown to them and their family during this time. We would like to thank Sister Carlson for our prelude music and also Sister Guki will be our chorister today. The family prayer was offered earlier uh, by Brother Noel Stoker. Um, and then we will begin our, begin this service with that opening hymn. It'll be hymn number 89, The Lord is My Light. And that'll be followed by the opening prayer by uh, Stephen Stoker. <clears throat>
Our Father in heaven, we come before thee this day with tenderness in our hearts, but with gratitude at the opportunity to honor the memory and the life of Brian Thornley. We are grateful for the teachings of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, which affirm to us the eternal nature of our souls. We are grateful to be here to remember the kindness and example of love and service that Brian Thornley provided. We honor him as a loving husband, father, grandfather, great-grandfather, brother, uncle, and friend. Ask thy blessing to be with us. Help us to know and have comfort this day that he is with others on the other side and that he is now free of the earthly struggles. Bless us to go forward following his example of devotion and testimony. And we ask thy blessing to be with us in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. amen. Yeah, the program will go as follows for today. Our first uh, first speaker will be a life sketch, life sketch by uh, Mark Thornley, his son. And then Jonathan Thornley will speak to us, followed by Robert Thornley. Uh, then we will have a musical number from the grandchildren and great grandchildren. I love to see the temple. That'll be accompanied by Lauren Thornley. Then we will then hear from Christine Smoot, his daughter, and then David Thornley. Uh, will be our concluding speaker. Following David, our closing hymn will be hymn number 113, Our Savior's Love, and our closing prayer will be offered by Mark Smoot. Ryan's six children provided the outline for this life sketch, but Rebecca Thornley, daughter-in-law, uh, brought him to life. Brian Floyd Thornley, beloved husband, father, grandfather, and friend to all, passed away peacefully at home in Logan, Utah on October 19th, 2023, surrounded by his loving family. For those who don't know, he, he died of complications to ALS. Brian didn't waste time wondering if life could be good. He just got busy living a good life. Born in Logan, Utah, July 20th, 1939, to Glenda Elaine Phillips and Heber Floyd Thornley. He was a small town boy who lived big in the best ways. He served a mission for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints in the Eastern States Mission, where he especially enjoyed his time serving in the mission home in New York City. After graduating from Utah State, he married the lovely Jean Stoker on September 5, 1962, and went on to graduate from Washington University School of Dentistry in St. Louis in 1966. They pursued their joint careers of homemaking and dentistry in Logan, where Brian started and worked at his own dental practice for 40 years. Jean and Brian raised six children and enjoyed 61 year, years together. Brian didn't count the cost of service. He just helped people wherever he was asked and where, wherever he saw a need. Everyone in his sphere knew they had a steady, capable, and creative advocate, someone who would generously give time and energy to their needs and who would hold on to the integrity of his own personality and convictions while appreciating theirs. Brian was cheerful member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and loved serving the Lord. His diligence, ability to inspire others, and uncanny organizational skills served him well in various church service opportunities, including bishop, stake president, temple sealer, and stake patriarch. Brian and Jean served as visitor center director in Oakland, New Zealand mission. He also served in many professional capacities, including president of the Utah Dental Association. His community service included um, Logan High PTA president and chair of the Cache County chapter of American Cancer Society. It was a gift to hear Brian laugh out loud in sincere enjoyment of a good story or joke. If the joke was on him, so much the better. 
He also delighted in every kind of athletics for the love of the contest and generous appreciation of achievement. He competed in several sports in high school and played baseball at Utah State, kept up a good golf game for decades, encouraged his kids in the sports and activities, then achieved the highest possible athletic status, happy member of the Grandpa Fan Club. Brian loved gardening and golfing, taking his sweetheart Jean to shop and travel and serving in the temple. He loved his Yankees and root beer, root beer floats. Brian loved Gene and his kids and grandkids, and every moment of work and sacrifice he gave is sanctified to them. He is survived by his loving wife, Gene Stoker Thornley, six children, David and Stephanie Thornley, Christine and Mark Smoot, Robert and Deanne Thornley, Stephen Thornley, Jonathan and Rebecca Thornley, and Mark and Heidi Thornley, along with 27 grandchildren and 18 great-grandchildren. He was preceded in death by his parents, a brother, Bruce and Delene Thornley, a sister, Bonnie Thornley, and a grandson, Wilson David Thornley. Now, I would like to add just a couple of things. My dad is my hero. Someday I'd like to be like him. Some say I even look like him. Many of you have told me this today that I'm just one step closer. Ever since I was about seven or eight, I wanted to be a dentist. I wanted to follow in his footsteps. Often I hear how amazing a man he was, uh, both as a professional, as a meticulous handiwork and, and his generous um, and gentle care. Um, the opening hymn we sang today, The Lord is My Light, is my son Andrew Brian Thornley's favorite hymn. Although he likes the version Jesus says mi luz better, Andrew serving the Mexico City South Mission. He would have loved to be here. The day and time my dad passed away was the day Andrew flew. From Salt Lake City to Mexico City, this mission. I'll try to read what he, he just sent a note last night, late last night, and I'd like to read what he said. My first day in Mexico, I received, and I quote, my first day in Mexico, I received the news that my grandfather passed away. Why not? When I heard the news of my grandpa, I cried hard and felt so alone in a different country. I remember I thought, why now? My middle name, Brian, is my grandpa's name, and he gave me his last patriarchal blessing. So recently, I've been feeling very close to him. My mission president invited me to read my patriarchal blessing my grandpa gave me. While reading it, I could feel my grandpa's love for me and, of course, my love for him. But it felt like I could understand the blessing in a different way. I wanted for, for him to see me grow and, and the amazing experiences, experiences I would have on my mission. But I, I know that now he can be here with me and witness it. When times get the hardest, I know God is there for me, along with my grandpa. Brothers and sisters, I love my dad. He showed me how to love others by example. But most importantly, he loved his heavenly father. I know that he lives. I know that our savior died for us, which makes it possible for us to be reunited and be and see him again. And I leave that testimony with you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Brothers and sisters, it's a privilege for me and an honor to be with you today. Uh, my whole life I've been surrounded by great, great people. Somebody needs to open this. Uh, growing up, I think I grew up in, oh, thank you. Uh, I think I grew up in the best place in the, in the world, surrounded by many wonderful and amazing people. And today I continue to work with amazing people and live around amazing people. I'm so grateful for those blessings in my life. I've been doing a lot of reading and reflecting um, I'm grateful for my dad. He, for me, personally, he is the perfect dad. Like Enos in the Book of Mormon, my father, father was a just man. 
and taught me in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, and blessed be the name of my God for it. I've been reading uh, from my grandpa's um, autobiography. He shared a few things about my dad. As a youngster, I thought some of these kids and grandkids would like to hear some of these stories. Grandpa Thornley said, and this is Brian Thornley's father, he said, a great event occurred in our family on Jan uh, July 20th, 1939, when a lovely blonde baby boy was born. We named him Brian Floyd and called him Brian. When he was three months old, his mother weaned him to a bottle. He soon adjusted to the bottle, but he developed a habit that was a little disconcerting. As he finished the last drop in the bottle, he would throw it with all the force of his little chubby arms. Now, mind you, uh, bottles back in this time were glass, not plastic. On many occasions, it would crash to many pieces on the floor or wherever it landed. Glenda and I became quite expert in catching the bottle in midair. We punished him for this costly habit, but to no avail. Later, later in life, he became a remarkable baseball pitcher. Perhaps his bottle throwing aided that talent. <clears throat> One more story. I practiced this talk this morning. It, it's about five minutes long. It took me about 15. So I'm sorry, Dave and everyone else. Um, one more story. And the term fisticuffs is used in this story. If you don't know what that is, that's, uh, that's when you use your fists to fight. As a young boy, he acquired a liking for fisticuffs and never let an opportunity for this activity pass without accommodating any who desired to indulge. This was especially true while we were in Sheridan, Wyoming, and he was in grade school. This behavior was quite a worry to his gentle mother and was a little concerned to his dad. He became quite proficient with his mitts and soon had no further trouble with boys of his own age. However, boys of the upper grades began to test his fiery disposition, and there were occasions when he arrived home just ahead of several big fellows. Fortunately, he was fleet of foot and had wisdom enough to know when to call a fast retreat. <clears throat> One of the quotes by my dad's computer from President Howard W. Hunter reads as follows. Please remember this one thing. If our lives and our faith are centered upon Jesus Christ and his restored gospel, nothing can ever go permanently wrong. My dad centered his life on the Savior. He was not without trials. When my dad was 23 years old, his amazing mother passed away. This was a tragedy for dad and his family. <clears throat> dad shared with me the words of comfort he received. Uh, comfort he received from priesthood leaders, especially from the stake president. My dad had held on to those words of comfort and hope and promise from this kind priesthood leader his whole life. I think some of my uh, the trials that my parents experienced came from raising their children. Uh, with the exception of maybe Mark, I think all of us tried to hold on to the title of black sheep. Uh, so I want to share one experience with you of my black sheep, black sheep moment. I think I was trying to take the title away from Steve at the time. <clears throat> when I was a teen teenager, one Sunday, I decided I wanted to sleep in. And mom couldn't persuade me to go to church. Dad was busy with meetings. He wasn't at home. And so the family left. And I was sleeping, not really, but I was in bed, pretending to be asleep. My dad soon came home after church, uh, not after church, during church. And dad was not super pleased with me. He was uh, sometimes impatient with us, with the decisions we made. But even with his... Mild rebuke.
I felt his intense love for me. He said to me, I'm not going to lose a son. Mom and dad uh, wept for us. They prayed for us. They worried about us. Um, they gave us lots of counsel, even if we didn't listen. But their aim, their goal, was for us to reach our highest potential, exaltation. Dad wanted more than anything for us to come into Christ, to enter into sacred covenants with the Lord and keep them. And he and mom showed us the way. There's one commandment that I think my father perfected. I think there's probably many, but there's one that in particular I'd like to highlight. In Doctrine and Covenants, section 42, 22, it reads, Thou shalt love thy wife with all thy heart and shalt cleave unto her and none else. My dad loved my mom with all his heart. Even my high school friends could easily see that he loved mom. A good high school friend of mine and Mark, Dave Beathers, sent me a text a few days ago. He said, I'll never forget how kindly, softly, and respectfully he treated your mother. What an incredible example to me. And this sister from New Zealand that mom and dad served with shared this to, to mom or with mom. I will always remember how cherished you and excuse me, I will always remember how he cherished you and treated you like the queen you are. Dad's most important event in his life happened on September 5th, 1962, when he and mom were sealed in the Logan Temple. I believe he was faithful to those covenants that he made, and I'm confident their sealing has been sealed by the Holy Spirit of promise. Dad had such wonderful hands. They were strong. His hands could handle delicate dental work, write beautifully, and work tirelessly. And perhaps most importantly, he used his hands to bless many of God's children. Mom shared with us recently how uh, when she was sick, she was really sick just this past week, how dad somehow managed the strength to walk. around the bed to give her a blessing. And he blessed her by the power of God with those wonderful hands. He was a faithful disciple of Jesus Christ. I think my dad would have a hard time listening to the nice things that uh, we'll say about him, but he would be the first to join in testifying of the divinity and reality of our savior, Jesus Christ. I know that it is through Jesus Christ that we can become clean of our sins if we repent. I know that because of the Savior's atoning sacrifice, we can be healed from all our wounds, whether caused by our own sins or the sins of others. All our heartaches, all our losses, death, disease, everything can be made perfectly right through the atoning sacrifice of our Savior. I know that because of Jesus Christ and his atoning sacrifice, Brian Floyd Thornley will be resurrected one day, and each of us will be. Although my dad was not perfect, he will be perfected through Christ. That is how I view my father. We all have the potential to be perfected through Christ if we choose to come unto him. If we choose to turn our lives over to him. He'll perform a miracle in us. And I say these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Thanks, Bark and Johns. Um, I would, well, let me first thank you for being here. We are so blessed to have amazing friends. 
family who have supported us and throughout our lives and uh, very touched through this process. I would like to wake you up a little bit and do some hallelujahs. It may not be appropriate in a dedicated covenant room like this, but I would propose that we maybe do a few hallelujahs in our hearts and in our minds because we are celebrating today. We're celebrating that God has a plan. We're celebrating that Brian Floyd Thornley lived the best he knew how according to that plan. And we're celebrating because we know he's in a good place. My dad gave me a great appreciation of God's creations of this beautiful earth. Uh, from Yellowstone trips to many trips to Moab. I just love this world. And I had a special tender mercy um, the couple of days after he passed. He, you may not have known this, but he was colorblind. But there was one color that was more vivid to him, and that was yellow, which is why we have a lot of yellow in the flower here. Um, but in those couple of days, uh, my wife and I traveled to Bear Lake and around town a lot, running errands uh, for these preparations. And the yellow leaves were spectacular, greater than I ever can remember. And I felt God's love seeing that and thinking of how my father blessed me with that appreciation. There's a little bit of irony with some things relating to my dad and baseball. He loved baseball. He loved the Yankees. And the year he was born, the Yankees won the World Series. And the ironic thing is that same year, Hall of Famer Lou Gehrig retired. And Lou Gehrig's disease is also known as ALS, which my father contracted. Uh, my dad was super quick on his feet. In case you're wondering, if you're walking in the dark at night in the wilderness, and you cannot see anything in front of you, there's some very special words he came up with really quick. <laughs> Terrified Uncle Mike, who is standing six inches from his face which then in turn terrified himself after Mike hollered. He was a great storyteller. My children, the siblings, we love to hear him tell stories. That was one of the, one of the finest stories we like to hear him tell. Now the secrets, uh, the cat's already out of the bag uh, with this black sheep thing. I was gonna talk about me being the black sheep, but I did hold the title by far the longest. Uh, in fact, my dad said of all the kids, he was quite certain that I was going to be a jailbird. I truly chased my brothers and friends around with knives. Uh, gloried when I made my brother Dave cry because I threw something, a rock at him or something. I thought I was tough because I made him cry. Um, I hung around with the likes of Stu Bringhurst and Brent Budge. Those that know him, these guys, you know, it's just doesn't get any worse, does it? It doesn't get any better. Um, but my dad knew how to lift. He knew how to build. And, and John shared some of that, light rebukes and um, turning something negative into a positive. Um, I was had this uh, little problem and it was I always got hurt because I did really really dumb stuff so you were running fast as you could and you decided to jump 50 flight of stairs yeah um, you decided to tie a rope behind the suburban and get dragged into ice clods for miles yeah and instead of saying you know you are really really dumb 
which was true. And now I know he said things like, boy, you're kind of accident prone, aren't you? And suddenly I had this badge of like, yeah, I'm accident prone. And I had my next cast, my next gash in the head, my next whatever. I'd tell people, yeah, I'm accident prone. Um, but my dad, a special quality he had, something he learned is that concept of waiting on the Lord. Waiting on the Lord involves trusting God's promises. And he had to go through some hard things. And one of those things he was waiting on the Lord, I know, and he didn't talk about much because it was such a trial of his life that he had to deal with for about 60 years. And I don't think he got answers to that until a couple of days ago. But he never doubted, and he kept waiting on the Lord and the answers. Um, I was named after Robert Thornley. Many of you saw the painting that was commissioned of the ox being pulled by Robert Thornley. Um, it's hard to believe that this was my dad's great grandpa and many here are great grandpas and this Robert Thornley was a pioneer that came across the plains it's amazing to me that how fast time goes when you think about the pioneers it seems like such a long time ago but Robert was the story behind it very quickly is uh, he and his brother and a cousin determined to leave Salt Lake Valley and settle in this beautiful valley that Brigham Young had said is one of the most special valleys anywhere, to Cache Valley. And they were the founding, found first settlers of Summit Creek, which was later named Smithfield. And on the journey, he and Annie Brighton, his young wife, they had just been married, uh, an ox gave out, and so he yoked himself up to the other ox and had Annie drive them for miles. And and there, there are varying stories within the family. They had 10 children and probably 20 different stories, but supposedly he never got whipped by Annie. In Matthew 11, it states, Come unto me, all ye that are labor, or all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. What Consider what rest means. I, I would propose that, in a large extent, it means peace. If you read the following verses, it says, Take my yoke upon you, and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart and you shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. And this is the lesson that my dad learned. Listen up. Tell myself that. You think, uh, oftentimes you might think of that verse as rest, and the Lord pulling you along. But really, to me, what it really means is being yoked is working with the Lord, pulling together. And if there's anything that was my dad, that was him. He never tired from service. He was always going. He was always serving he was yoked with my mom, my dear mom, together raising their crazy five boys and one responsible daughter. But he was yoked to the Savior throughout his life. 
he was not only convinced of the truthfulness of the gospel of Jesus Christ, but he was converted to it, and it showed by his action and by his service. He, throughout his working career, he would go to the temple every single Wednesday for about 40 years straight, every week. That's just a small sample. He loved to serve in the temple. He had the marvelous opportunity to serve as a sealer in the Logan Temple for years. And this, to me, tells me who this man was. He told me that it was more devastating to him when he could no longer serve as a sealer in the temple than the diagnosis of ALS, a terminal disease. I'm sure that he was close to the veil, serving in that temple. And I don't know how he did it, but he found a window and he got through that veil in perfect timing before he had to suffer a whole lot more. One last thing, because Dave wants to delight us with all kinds of stuff. And Chris. He loved deeply. I gave him a lot of grief, but I knew he always loved me. I brought into his fold new family members that were not of blood line, but he loved them as their grandchildren and great-grandchildren. Roman, Hayden, Matt, Sam, Emily, Spencer, and others. They all view him as a grandpa, and he viewed them the same. And we all truly miss him. I testify that we have a beloved Savior who knows all pains, knows all suffering, knows all affliction. And that as we yoke ourselves to the Savior, as I believe my father did. What well, life will be as good as it can be. And I promise that there will be everlasting joy in the eternities to come. So grateful to be a, have been a son of my dad, who I love so much and will miss. And I share this in the name of the beloved Savior, our Redeemer, our all in all. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.
Well, I prepared three different talks. I'm not sure which one's going to come out. <laughs> but I want to start um, on behalf of Grandpa to thank all of you for coming up to sing that song. The temple is a very sacred place, and it's a place of peace. And my father taught me by example the blessing the temple can be in his life and in mine. When I was um, a teenager, when I Whenever I got the car, which we we never had designated cars, we just shared cars, I would often at night um, go and park across the street from the temple just to look at its beauty. I love to go at night to see the lights on the temple. And at that time, <clears throat> As youth, we didn't go to do baptisms on our own. We couldn't We couldn't just go on our own. We went with our ward. So I didn't have the opportunity to go that often. And when that changed for the youth, that became a wonderful blessing. So because I didn't have that opportunity, I still felt the peace and the comfort from the temple. And so I would go and park. contemplate life, try to figure out who I was. And I wasn't very much, but the Lord knew I was there, and he met me where I was. And I just want to challenge each of you who are in this room to consider your relationship with God and your ability to go to the temple wherever you are, whether it's inside, whether it's outside. First, I got to show you something. This is Brian reincarnated. There's a picture out there. This is little Malcolm. He looks just like him. <laughs> President Nelson said, loving relations, relationships continue beyond the doors of death and judgment. Family ties endure because of ceilings in the temple. Their importance cannot be overstated. Dad knew that 100%. And as a sealer in the temple, as he said the word, the beautiful words to the ceiling prayers, he internalized them and he understood them even more more than I understand, but I know, I know he had a strong testimony of that. And I think that is appropriate for me as his daughter to challenge you to, to strengthen yourself and your relationship with Jesus Christ. Um, Dave has a really great long talk. So I'm going to, I'm going to look through all my talks here. Um, this scripture has always been one of my favorites. And as dad was um, starting to deteriorate, even before we knew his diagnosis, we knew something was wrong and, and he knew something was wrong. And this scripture kept coming to my mind and it just uh, is a scripture that I feel like he lived and had in his heart at all times. It's second Nephi three twenty. Ye must press forward with a steadfastness in Christ, having a perfect brightness of hope and a love of God and of all men. Wherefore, if ye shall press forward, feasting upon the word of Christ and endure to the end, behold, thus saith the father, ye shall have eternal life. 
I know dad is, is on the path there towards eternal life. He's practically perfect. I know he isn't, but he's practically perfect. I am so grateful for the example that he set for me and for my family, for the love he showed all of us, for the service he gave to many. If I could just follow one ounce of his example, I'd probably be there. And I'm so grateful for him. And I'm so grateful to my Heavenly Father for sending me to mom and dad's home for the goodly parents and the wonderful place that I was able to grow up and the great memories. I'm so grateful to have my Savior, Jesus Christ, that we can all live again and we can all be together and we are sealed. And I'm so grateful for that. And I say this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Okay, I wrote it all out in case Stephanie needs to come and give it, okay? Um, let's see. I am really appreciative to my siblings for the amazing people they are. I'm appreciative to all of you who have loved dad so much. Um, I am very humbled and honored and feel very inadequate to talk about my dad. But I wanted to make a couple of um, references to him. How many of you have ever been to Sequoia National Park? They have giant trees there. They're sequoias. They're bigger than redwoods. They're sequoias. Maybe a cousin to the redwoods. I've been there, and of course, my parents took me there when we were going to visit the Stoker family, our aunt and uncle, and our cousins. And I'm sure grandma and grandpa Stoker went with us, which they were a big part of our lives growing up too. moms, mother and father. Well, those trees, if you've ever seen them, they're huge. They're like 30 feet across. They're literally giants, the biggest living things on earth. That's if, if people were trees, dad would be a sequoia. And not only that, he'd probably be General Sherman or General Grant, okay? The two biggest ones. He'd be right up there with them, 100%. Let me just tell you a couple reasons why. And he did ask that he wanted a one-hour. I've got one-hour meeting. I've got probably three hours. You guys want to stay a little longer? But I'll see what I can do to get through a few of the things. This is just... A touch and I think my my siblings have done an amazing job telling about dad and all of you know dad so you know all these things but um, I wanted to say one reason he's a giant he was a great athlete he instilled the love of sports to all of us boys why would sports make you cry that's stupid anyway I saw him never having played tennis pick up a racket and just be good at it instantly I mean, it was amazing. Um, he loved golf. That's been said. He loved golf. He didn't develop a love for that until he was an adult. He didn't really get to play it when he was young. And he golfed. He, he was telling me just a few days ago, he said the last time he golfed was 14 months ago. And it was August of last year. And he said he knew that he was declining and he didn't know exactly what was wrong. But it, the last day that he golfed, he could hardly grip the club. He had no strength. He couldn't hit the ball, ball very far. But guess what? He still played bogey golf. He still shot a 44. That's that's amazing. Um, in, in high school, he played basketball for Logan High. And after high school, he was named to the all-church team in 1959. Now, if any of you guys, older people, know what that means, that's a big deal. All the church, the entire church had a tournament and they would play. We'd play against everybody around here, Salt Lake, everywhere. It was a tournament within the entire church. 
and he was named on the all church team. I thought that was pretty fantastic. Um, as been said, he was a great pitcher. He had a great arm. He honed his skills in his mother and father's uh, garage. He would get a tennis ball, and at about 12 years age, of age, he decided he was going to strengthen his arm. So he would go out there and throw this tennis ball against that garage for hours and hours and hours. He told me that after a while, the bricks started loosening, <laughs> the mortar started falling out, and he he literally, you know, he was a good athlete. He had great natural skills, but he worked at it. He worked and worked and he worked at it, just like he did in many other things. So he went on to play. Um, oh, I was going to say, back then, baseball was the sport. It was the big sport. It was bigger than football. It was bigger than basketball. And every single team, every single city in town had a team. And they'd go around and they'd play every Saturday. And everybody from those little towns would go there to watch them play baseball. It's crazy. Cornish, Mendon, Smithfield, Hiram, all these places. And he said, what a great time he had playing baseball for years in these, in these events. He went on to play uh, Utah State baseball. And when he was there, it was a sanctioned sport. So now it is not. It's just a club sport. So he, at the time, he broke a school record for the most strikeouts in a game. And it was, he told me a few months ago, it, it was a seven inning game and it was 13 strikeouts. So to our knowledge, he still holds the Utah State record, okay, for strikeouts. Pretty dang cool. Um, another thing that when I, when I was young, see, I'm the oldest. Um, and so I got to see dad at a young age when he was in his prime and he would play when we had ward softball. I never forget. He was, he'd always play third base or shortstop that hit the ball to him and he'd have perfect fielding every time he never missed the ball. But then when he would throw it, he had such a strong arm. You would watch the trajectory of that ball rise. He would start it low and it would go just like this. And I was always amazed at, you know, what a strong arm he had. And then when he would get up to bat, he was good at that too. When he or Jim Kemp got up to bat, the outfield would immediately, you know, go way back. And there was no fence at the time. And invariably, both of those guys would hit it past their heads. <laughs> it was fun to watch. And because of that, that got me very interested in sports. And um, it, sports have blessed my life, the, my entire life. His legendary, his organizational skills are legendary. He was probably one of the top five customers of Franklin Day Planner, for sure. And he had, he had like apples 40 years ago, those Apple computers. And he would write his talks on those Apple computers and keep records and documents and everything. He was an early adopter of all things organizational. It was so cool. Um, in fact, because he was such a great record keeper, he and I were talking about trips to Yellowstone that we would have to go fishing. And back in the day, you could catch tons of fish. He, he said, so he pulled up. He pulled us one example. So he pulled up an example was June 15th, 1999. And he pulls us up, pulls the page out. And he's like, okay, here's all the people there. He listed all the people. He's like, and, and even my friend, John Worley and his son, Jake were there. So he listed everybody. And then he listed how many fish per person each person caught that day. And so... Um, I didn't write all of those down, but I did write the ones down that I was interested in. He said, of course, he had 64 fish that day, which uh, was the most, of course. Uh, my nine-year-old son was close at 60, and I was down the road at 50 or something like that. It actually was 50, and not something like that. It was 50. He had the record. And, and so... I'm just, I was just amazed. You could go back and you could find out so much stuff. I hope, I hope he didn't write down all the bad stuff because I, ho I hope to not run into some of that stuff. But anyway, um, another thing that I, I had talked to him maybe a couple of years ago about was there was a, a certain episode that was kind of a big deal. And he handled it in my mind in a certain way that was different 
than the way I handled the situation. It was kind of a, a tough deal. And he said, no, Dave, I, I felt the same way that you did about it. And I thought he was just, um, you know, trying to keep the peace or, or, or whatever. Um, but he said, let's go to my notes and let's go check it out. He's like, okay, this discussion I had was this date, roughly this month. And let's see if I can go through the days and find it. He goes right to that date. Boom. He had this record like you wouldn't believe. And not only did he agree with how I had interpreted the situation, but he had a whole bunch of prophecy in there. No joke. A whole bunch of stuff that he said that came true later. And I was just blown away by it. I was shocked. Um, he was a great family man and always balanced his priorities. When he, he was called to leadership positions at a very early age, he was a bishop three times, blah, blah, blah. He was called to be my bishop when I was a teenager and I was hacked off. I was mad. And you know why? Because like, they're going to take my dad away. I'm not going to see him again. And somehow he figured out, he proved that he could balance all those things. He could balance his growing family, his church work, his profession. Um, he, he had time to take us to Arches, to Canyonlands, the Yellowstone, to this is a real place, President, Bishop. Bitch Creek is a real place in Idaho, and it's a great place to fish. And we went there, and we went to, um, you know, all these places. We purchased dirt bikes, and we rode all these places, and we rode on Slick Rock Trail and all those sorts of things. And I love dirt bikes, and Dad made an agreement with me one time. He said, okay. I will, I will let you get your own dirt bike if you can raise half the money. So I worked hard painting fences, working at Utah State grounds crew, whatever I had to do to earn that money. And I think it was $700 was half. And, but that's a lot when you're making dollar ten an hour, right? Um, and he helped me buy that brand new Suzuki, 1979 Suzuki PE250. And I, to me, that represents the kind of love that a father and son can share. Just amazing. I um, also think about the fact that we went on all these trips and we did all these things and he had all these church responsibilities and he was a dentist, as all of you know, and he would take time off, right, to, to do these things. And as all of you know, dentists do not make money if they're not in the office, and I was always surprised or actually looking back on it. I wasn't surprised then. It was just dad had plenty of money. We can do whatever we want to do. It's great. But now I'm very surprised that he was able to do all those things. And he was successful in his profession. Um, but I can tell you this money was not his focus. So his focus was the family and supporting them. It was just a means. Um, all these different things that we did, I must not minimize the support of mom. She had an amazing capacity to support dad and everything. You know, in, in in some other marriages, if she hadn't have been loyal to the church and to dad, then I'm sure there's plenty of great leaders out there that can't serve because they have to take care of other things. She was very supportive in everything. And she allowed dad to do all these things. And I'll never forget when we'd plan for a camping trip or whatever, she'd be cooking for weeks and putting things together, and getting everybody's clothing and everything. She worked like a dog, if you will, getting ready for those trips. She had a lot of energy, you know, she had a ton. She, had, she was a tireless bundle of energy and they made a great pair. All of you have heard about his priorities of temple attendance. And he, I would say that this was his happy place for 50 years. This is where he found peace. And then there's a funny story. So he and his dad, Heber Floyd, uh, his, he had outlived um, two wives, grandpa did. And so dad would pick him up and they would go every Wednesday morning together while grandpa was still alive, they would go to the temple. And there was one particular time where they're, um, 
in the waiting room and grandpa's about 84 or 85 at this time. And there was an older gentleman over there, probably younger than grandpa. And he wasn't walking that well. Grandpa was very hard of hearing. And here's what he said to dad as they're sitting there. He whispered in a very loud voice. Look at that old cripple guy over there. Isn't that a shame? And dad was just like oh, shrinking in his boots. But he just he loved to tell that story, <laughs> how his dad embarrassed him and how fun it was to hang out with his dad and the hard of hearing stories and all that kind of thing. Um, in 1977, the Logan Temple was remodeled and dad was obsessed with it. He would go over there and he wasn't supposed to, I'm sure, but he took me several times and we went over there and we walked up to the top of the temple, looked over the valley, scared me to death, look over, over that, you know, um, precipice, if you will, on top. He, he walked on the ladders up in the spires. He walked, he walked through every piece of that room, at every piece of that temple. He even got some artifacts. So they were discarding things. And there was some really pretty old gold leaf wallpaper. And he would grab that and bring that home and, and have that. They were just going to throw it away. So he took it. Um, but the, the point I want to make is, is that the temple has meant a lot to him from day one. And I hope that we can find that same joy and peace that he found. Okay, not too much more, just three or four pages. Um, he was the undisputed leader and rock of the family. So some of you know that my son died on Easter Sunday, 2015. And my good friend, Larry Wright, who's here today, was the one that called me as me and Stephanie and the kids, the younger kids, were coming home from spring break in Moab. And he said something like this. He said, uh, there's about 15 police, ambulance, um, cars over, you know, emergency vehicles over at your house. And it's about Will. And he, I think he's passed. Actually, I think he knew it. He said he's passed. And what do you think the first thing I did was I called dad. I said, dad, go over there, see what's going on. Give him a report back. And dad ran right over to our house, probably 10 minutes away. And um, he started going in there and they were trying to keep him from going there. And many of you know that, that dad, 99% um, of the time, if he wanted something, he got it. He just told him, listen, this is my grandson that's over here. I don't care what you say. I'm walking over there and I'm going to go see him. So he goes in there uh, and Will is out on the patio. Um, and he, he called me back later and said he looked so peaceful. He said, I got a calm feeling. He looked so peaceful. He looked beautiful. The sun was shining on his golden, long golden hair. And he's, he's, you know, he looks really peaceful. And that day, that work that he did for us instilled a great deal of courage to, to me to face that tragic event. Another event was Cade had a, had a problem where we found through an MRI and x-ray, a growth in his, his brain a lesion, if you will. And it was potentially life threatening. And Stephanie and I were devastated. I was beside myself. So what did I do? I called the guy that, <clears throat> excuse me, has the most faith and power that I know. Dad and asked him for a bless to give Kate a blessing. So what did he do? He immediately started to fast right that moment, and he agreed to do it. Then he started, he wanted to see the x-rays. He wanted to um, study everything he could about it and seek the Lord's will before he gave that blessing. And on the day they gave the blessing, which I think was the subsequent next day, he gave one of the be most beautiful blessings. And he said many inspiring and inspiring things very inspiring and inspired things. He had a gift. And after the blessing, 
we felt the calmness and a peace. And dad said, basically, he said, I got this impression from the Lord that Cade's going to have a normal life and everything's going to be okay. And Cade continues to get MRIs on his brain and he continues to get a bill of health from the doctor. Um, I am very grateful for that, for dad's righteousness, his preparation and his healing gifts. Um, dad loved a good laugh as has been talked about. I remember watching the Peak Panther series with dad, with Peter Sellers. He and I would just roll. We would just laugh so hard and we'd be crying. My wife's favorite memory of dad is they were, we were at Bear Lake at their house there at Bear Lake. And, uh, she couldn't find, or we couldn't find dad. He was in the back room where we had a little VCR TV combination with a couple of the kids just watching by himself, the movie dumb and dumber and just laughing his head off him and these little kids, the kids didn't even know what was going on, but he was just, <laughs> just laughing. Oh my gosh. So dad had a, he had a fun sense of humor and I, I hope that didn't, and you create a lower feeling of him okay <laughs> but but he was human okay he was human he's pretty supernatural but he was human too um here's some of the stories that bob alluded to and that that we have record of when when i found out dad had als i didn't care about him writing his personal history i know that and it's in all of his books okay i wanted to know all the, him to record in his own words all his funny stories so here, here are some of the ones that, that I've heard that I wanted him to record. Who you want? Zzz, kindergarten kisser. Bad lemonade. Right on, huh? Blue flame. Basketball tip story, Uncle Noel. Bruce and the mutt. Mom, not a nut mother. Jean, Jean, the baby machine, Uncle Mike. Nate, pocket knife. Naked locked out swimming pool at Logan High. Ish Billy Otendote. Merlin Olson kissing story. They're all great. And I know that he was able to record some of these, but I remember them. I can't tell them like dad did. I mean, he's really had a gift. He could really get you interested and really tell a good story. <clears throat> Sorry. Um, let's see. One last funny story that I wanted to, to tell. And that was Elder Didier came as a visitor to our house. Uh, when he was a stake president, the general authorities would come to the house and stay overnight. And that pained mom. She hated it. Like, you know, she was already a clean freak, but now everything got turned upside down and we got to make this right. And we don't have time to remodel. And, well, you know, we got to do all this stuff. And, um, and, and so she was a nervous wreck, but she's a great cook. So I guarantee they had a great time. Well, anyway, this elder DDA came and he's a stern guy. Some of you people might know stern guy. Don't think he's the warmest guy in the world. Okay. You know, the Lord uses all kinds of people to do his work, right? Warm ones, not warm ones, et cetera, et cetera. Well, so my son, Will, who's a prolific talker at an early age, he talked earlier than any person I've ever met. Like one years old, he was already saying stuff. So he was probably two at this time. And we wanted to, him, I, we were invited to mom and dad's house to go meet Elder Didier. And um, he wanted, um, I wanted him to go shake his hand. So we went up there and I whisper in Will's ear right before he gets to Elder Didier to, to talk, to say something. He said, I said to him, okay, say, all you have to do is say, hi, Elder DDA. And he rushes up there, puts his hand up, the little guy, the little two-year-old, and he says, hey, DDA, just like that. And Elder DDA was taken aback and he didn't really like it. <laughs> And we were so embarrassed, but, but we we love that story. I love telling that story. It was a fun time. Dad had a lot of bald jokes he used to tell. He didn't seem to be upset by being bald. I think it's so cool that he wasn't upset. If I'd have lost my hair, I'd probably be in the grave right now. Um, but anyway, one of the one of the favorite things that he would say says the the Lord made a few perfect heads. 
the rest he put hair on. He'd say that a lot. Um, okay, I'm almost done, I promise. Um, all right. My dad helped me graduate from high school, and I didn't even know it. He went to my type teacher and helped me get a D minus instead of an F, and I didn't know that I was, and I didn't care. Um, but he helped. And after my mission, I wanted to be a dentist too. Okay, I want to follow in dad's footsteps. I guess I'm not as smart as Mark or the other boys. And I took a couple of chemistry classes. I said, nah, I'll just stick with business. I'm not doing that. So I was a little bit lost. I didn't know what to do. Uh, eventually, uh, as time went on, I was talking to my dad one day, and he said something to me that stuck with me forever. He said, Dave, I think you should be in sales. So I went with it, and I made a career in sales, and it's worked out ever since. Um, in conclusion, two couple of things. One's, one's actually a scripture, so that's good. The song's been playing in my mind from Dan, Dan Fogelberg, and it says, the leader of the band is tired. His eyes are growing old, but his blood, blood runs through my instruments, and his song is in my soul. My life has been a poor attempt to imitate the man. I am a living legacy to the leader of the band. I hope in particular all of his family members can be the right living legacy that dad would be proud of. I find peace in the words of Alma who said, the spirit and the body shall be reunited again in its perfect form. Both, both limb and joint shall be restored to its proper frame. Now this restoration shall come to all, both the old, the young, the bond and the free, the male and the female, and even there shall not be so much as one hair of their heads be lost, but everything shall be restored to its, per its perfect frame. Here's kind of how I picture dad in the resurrection. And this isn't exact, but I've just been thinking about this. I picture his resurrection will have hair from when he was 20. Yeah, maybe 16. Hair when, from when he was 16. His body maybe when he was 30 at his prime. Uh, his skills, leadership and organizational skills from maybe 40 to 50 his spirituality, 60 to 70, and the wisdom, 70 plus, the wisdom and the proper perspective of the rest. Um, every time my dad greeted me, he would say, hi, Dave. And I can just hear that. He said it every time. And it had meaning behind it. But I will hear that in my mind the rest of my life until I can hear it from him in person. I'm grateful to all of you. I'm grateful to my dad, to my mother, my brothers, my sister, my own family, and extend our love to you, our immense love to all of you who are here today. And and others who have come and supported us. And I say this in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Sorry, I neglected to say, following the uh, benediction, if we could ask the pallbearers to come forward and then uh, to escort uh, Brian from the building. And then if everyone would please rise and, and uh, allow the family to, to leave. We will, uh, Brian will be, um, um, laid to rest at the Logan Cemetery. Uh, following this meeting, we really congregate there.
Our Father in heaven, we come before thee at the close of this service. We express our gratitude to thee. We are thankful for the gifts of life that thou has bestowed upon us. We're thankful for the gift of family, for the gift of community, and for the many people that are here and are bonded one with another. We thank thee for the gift of the atonement of the resurrection and the goodness that comes from our Savior and his life. We pray as we go forth today that we may have safety, that as we continue to reminisce and consider the goodness of life that we enjoy because of Brian and his posterity, we pray that we might go forward in faith, we may go forward in courage, and be able to be positive legacy and that you would be proud of. We can express our gratitude for all that thou hast blessed us with and say this in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.